Okay. Okay. So first of all, thanks, uh, uh, Andrea and team for uh, organizing this and for inviting me to come give a talk on some of the early work that we've been doing uh, applying synthetic control uh, to analyze uh, the COVID spread. So synthetic control is a relatively new uh, methodology, new technique. So what I'll do is first I'll give a quick overview of what synthetic control is, and then I'll explain how we can use synthetic control uh, to analyze COVID-19 spread. And I'll present some of the early results that we have, and then, then I'll uh, uh, talk about some of the ongoing work. So first, uh, background on synthetic controls. So synthetic controls is uh, an empirical metro uh, methodology for causal inference using observational data. And this was introduced in the early 2000s uh, by uh, uh, Albert Abati, uh, an economist at MIT. And the earliest applications were for uh, analysis of policy uh, to analyze the impact of policy. So the canonical application of this is uh, this policy called Prop 99 in California. So in 1988, California voters passed this law called Prop 99 which imposed a 25 cent tax on every packet of cigarettes sold and, uh, and so a similar amount on other tobacco products. And the idea was, first of all, it'll make cigarettes more expensive so less people would smoke. Secondly, the revenue that they raised through this program, they would use it to uh, uh, do educational talks in schools and, and colleges about the harms of tobacco, fund uh, tobacco, cancer research, run anti-tobacco advertisements and so on. So there were two questions related to this. First, did California see a reduction in smoking? The answer was yes. 10 years later, they saw that human per capita, per capita smoking had gone down. The second and more sort of important question was, was it because of Prop 99 or did society simply move on from smoking? Because national averages fell as well. Now, in an ideal world, what you would do is you would have a California with Prop 99 and a California without Prop 99 and then observe smoking rates. If you see a difference, then you can say, okay, Prop 99 did make a difference. If there's no difference, then you know, Prop 99 was like a placebo. So the idea behind synthetic controls was that, uh, imagine the time series of uh, uh, California uh, per capita smoking. And what uh, Alberto, uh, the insight was that you can approximate that time series using the same similar time series of the other 49 states. So what you can do is you can construct a synthetic version of California by a combination of other states. So, so for example here, what I'm showing is that California is like 40% New York, 50% Massachusetts, and 10% uh, Texas. Now the key assumption here is this, the, the intervention is applied only to the treatment unit, not donor units. So the intervention here is Prop 99. It's only applied to California, but not to the other states. And then once we have this synthetic version, we train this model pre-application of Prop 99. And beyond uh, uh, the date, 1988, we compare the synthetic version of California with actual California. And if you see a difference, then you know Prop 99 had an impact. So here I'll show you the results. Uh, the left graph shows uh, the impact of uh, Prop 99 using a synthetic control approach. So the vertical line that you see is uh, the date uh, when Prop 99 was passed. The solid line is per capita smoking in California. The dashed line, which is trained on data uh, to the left of the vertical line is synthetic California. And the dashed line to the right of the vertical line is generated purely from the other states. So California plays no part in generating that line. And as you can see clearly that uh, there is a significant impact of Prop 99. Smoking fell sharper in real California versus synthetic California. Now the conventional way to do this uh, uh, analysis or comparison is to do an A-B testing view, which is on the right uh, graph. There also you can see that Prop 99 made an impact, but it's not as clear, clearly visible as a synthetic control approach. So synthetic controls uh, give a more precise and informative answer to the counterfactual, what if there was no Prop 99? So in the case of uh, COVID, we can ask and answer questions like, what if there was no lockdown? Or what if schools were closed earlier? And all sorts of interventions. Now, one might say by looking at this graph, you know, I can fit any sort of curve to any sort of data, right? So is the fit of synthetic California on the left just, you know, overfitting of data into uh, samples? 
So the way you can answer that question is uh, do the same kind of synthetic model for placebos. So you take other states, uh, let's say Colorado or some other state, and build a synthetic Colorado out of the data from the other 48 states. We will not pick California because California has the intervention. Now we have a synthetic Colorado and an actual Colorado. If after this phantom imposition of Prop 99, synthetic uh, Colorado and actual Colorado track each other, that means our model actually is predictive. It, 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 it was able to model what's happening in Colorado by the other states and things are working well. And so if there's no intervention, then the counterfactual actually is a prediction of the observed. And this is exactly what we see. So here are some examples of uh, states. We did not have uh, Prop 99, but we still created a synthetic model and did a projection. And you can see that the projection tracks the actual world. So this indicates that we can also forecast evolution for placebos if the future evolution of donor pool is available. So suppose our time axis is not absolute but some sort of relative time axis where some donor pool elements are ahead of the treatment unit and it's a placebo, then what we can do is we can project out into the future by using those uh, donor pool elements. So our work, you know, this is with my collaborators at MIT, we have extended synthetic control for predictions as well as uh, multi-dimensional models. So now what I'll do is I'll move on to COVID analysis and how the data is analyzed and processed uh, for COVID and how we can use synthetic control. So I'm sure you have seen uh, uh, graphs like this all over the place, which are sort of tracking death rates or case rates uh, in various places. Often uh, these graphs are plotted on a log scale. I have some issue with that, but regardless. So here you see uh, graphs like this. Now the key aspect of these graphs is that the timelines are not aligned when you talk about absolute times the virus reached different places at different points of time. So the way you sort of bring them all together into one graph is you pick a threshold in terms of deaths or cases, and this threshold could either be absolute or population adjusted, and you start tracking a region when it hits a th that threshold. So for instance, here I've picked a threshold of 100 deaths. The day that region hits 100 death, I assign it uh, a t equal to zero, and then I start tracking the deaths in that region from then on. So now what happens is now different regions are now aligned in terms of when the virus was active. So the T equal to zero on the X axis is now aligned, but different regions are at different stages of the, the evolution. So the graph that you see on the bottom, which extends beyond 70 days is that of Wuhan. So Wuhan has had 100 deaths or more for more than 70 days. The US is somewhere below 30 days uh, in terms of 100 day deaths. So now we have the scenario where we have different uh, time series of different durations. Now we can build synthetic COVID models by using the following process. First, we'll identify a donor pool of regions where the spread has been active for a fairly long, long period. In this example, I'm just picking 30 days. So first you identify this donor pool of uh, regions where the COVID has been active for a long period. Then what you do is you pick target areas to build the model where the spread has not been as long as those donor pool elements, but long enough for us to build some sort of a model. So, so let's say I've picked between 15 and 30 days. So now the idea is I'll train a model, I'll build a synthetic model using the first 15 days of data. And then I'll test using data between 15 and 30 days. So depending on how far this target uh, region is in its timeline, we can compare the prediction to the uh, actual data. So now what I'll do is I'll present some early results. And what I'm going to do is I'll, I'm going to show a, a graph similar to the Prop 99 graph, but I'll also show uh, what... This is one minute, Mark. Yeah, what regions in the donor pool contributed to this... Uh, uh, synthetic model. So first let's look at uh, New York. Now this model is producing disturbingly accurate predictions. Right? It's, I've, I've trained it on 15 days and up on uh, to the 30th day I'm able to predict almost exactly where it's going. Now if you see the donor pool, it's uh, mainly Western European countries. 
France, Italy, Spain. If I remove those Western European countries uh, from the donor pool and I build another synthetic model, then the predictions are a lot more optimistic than what the actual data is. The thing to note here is the training fit is near perfect in both cases, whether the donor pool had Western Europe or not. But in one case, the predictions are accurate. In another case, the predictions are very optimistic. Let's take a look at another state, Ohio. So if I build a model for Ohio and I include Western Europe, then my model is giving pessimistic predictions. If I take Western Europe out, the pre prediction will become more accurate. Now, people say that Ohio is one of the earliest states to react and lock down. So the interventions, they were different from what really happened in Western Europe. So it's not clear what the cause is, but picking the right donor pool gives you a, a very good uh, predictions and sort of picking a different donor pool gives you counterfactuals. So this is now the final slide. This is a summary of the ongoing work that synthetic controls is a promising data-driven way to do projections, but picking the right donor pool is important. So what we're working on is uh, developing a systematic way to identify the right donor pool based on data-driven techniques, intervention information, demographics, and all sorts of things. The second thing, important thing, which hopefully came out from the previous two examples, is that right donor pools also gives a clue on what kind of interventions work. Michelle, sure, we're really out of time. Yeah, so this is my final slide. I can stop here. People can look at it, and I'll take questions. OK. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, Darcy, you should be able to talk, and Yuan Hu. There's a preprint on BioArchive um, looking at the possible, basically looking at New York and looking at the po on how likely it is to avoid 100,000 deaths based on uh, models of R0 um, and assumptions about, uh, I wondered if you'd seen this preprint. Uh, I have not. So thank you for the question and if you can just... Uh... Uh, I'm I'll send it to you. Yeah, it, yeah. it comes up with a very pessimistic prediction for New York. Okay. So the thing is, uh, the the, uh, uh, the more reliable I have, quote unquote, future data, the better are my predictions. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the future data is coming from regions in China, and the question is whether that data is reliable or not. So as I go further out in my predictions, my data gets influenced by what's uh, been reported out of. Wuhan and other regions in China, because that's where this thing has happened for the longest time. So, uh, you know, my predictions right now are not that pessimistic uh, of New York crossing 100,000 deaths, but uh, we'll see. So I just wanted to add that the, the other thing that you can do with this approach of synthetic control is you can also quickly predict what FDA approved drugs might have a higher chance of being successful using historical clinical data. So this is also an ongoing effort with collaborators at MIT, and I'm happy to talk to anyone offline about it. Thank you.